بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم إن الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله العظيم من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلن تجد له وليا مرشدا وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له له الملك وله الحمد وهو على كل شيء قدير We begin by praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala We seek his mercy and we seek his forgiveness and we send our peace and blessings upon his last and final messenger, the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant shifa to all those amongst us in our communities and around us who are sick. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have mercy on all those in our families, in our communities, around us and around the world who have passed away. Uh, dear brothers and sisters, I want to kind of pick up on where uh, our dear brother, uh, Dr. Abdul Jabbar, left off uh, when it comes to the rights of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala upon us. And the verse, the very last verse that he mentioned is actually where I wanted to begin. But I want to actually start by quoting our dear brother, um, one of the, the, the true revivers of the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, our dear brother Al Hajj uh, Malik Shabazz, Malcolm X, who, when he went to perform Hajj, and that's really where that turning point for him was in his life of witnessing the unity of Islam and the true brotherhood and spirit of brotherhood of Islam. And he wrote back to his wife that America needs to understand Islam because this is the one religion that erases from its society the race problem. SubhanAllah, this is such a profound statement to make after this one trip uh, you know, to Hajj and seeing this universal coming together of colors and ethnicities and cultures and languages that he understood from this one gathering, SubhanAllah, after being a Sunni Muslim barely for a few weeks, that America needs to understand the religion of Islam because this is the one religion that erases from its society the race problem. So the question is for us, how does Islam erase this problem from the society? How does Islam erase the problem of racism from society? And there's a, there's a narration uh, where one of the companions of the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Abu Dar Al-Ghifari Radiallahu Ta'ala Anhu, and we all know this narration, where he turned to Bilal Ibn Rabah Radiallahu Anhu, and he said to him, and he referred to him as Yibn al Sauda, O son of a black woman. Just three words, right? You son of a black woman in, in Arabic, just three words he, he, he mentioned to Bilal radiallahu anhu. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he heard this statement and he turned red and he got upset at Abu Dhar for uttering a factual statement. We all say this is, this is true and this is something that you and I might say all the time. I didn't say anything wrong. I didn't say a lie. I'm just stating something that's true. I'm just stating the color of their skin. And so Abu Dar radiallahu anhu did the same. And the Prophet ﷺ said that, Oh Abu Dar, you still have a little bit of jahiliyyah in you. You still have a little bit of that pre-Islamic ignorance inside of you. We have to understand the, the, the profundity of that statement of, uh, subhanAllah, of, of jahiliyyah. Uh, you still have this ignorance in you because Islam, no doubt, came. Uh, you know, the Quran was revealed. Allah says, To take mankind out of the many different levels of darkness into the light of Islam. And so, Islam, the Quran came, the religion came to t remove the people away from their ignorance, their acts of jahiliyyah into the light of Islam. It came as a solution to that. Maybe Malcolm X subhanAllah didn't even read this verse or many of these verses. He lived that experience. He understood, you know, with one experience that subhanAllah, Islam has a solution. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala taught us this 
1400 years ago. And so when the Prophet says to Abu Dhar, you still have some ignorance in you, you still have a little piece of that, your 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 past actions and behavior in you. What the Prophet is trying to tell him is when you said La ilaha illallah, when you accepted this religion, when you were a Muslim, this all should have been gone. This should have been eradicated from your life. This there should be no peace of even a hint of racism in your life. And Abu Dhar obviously did not intend to make a racist comment, and we don't say that he was racist, but just one statement, subhanAllah. We know from, from Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha when she used her hand and didn't even utter a statement, and she referred uh, to one of the other wives of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam as being short, and she just went like this. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said that if, what you just did was a statement and you spit it into the ocean, the entire ocean would be corrupted, subhanAllah. So this, you know, Abu Dhar and Bilal issue, I just want to focus on it a little bit more because we also take from this, subhanAllah, the rank and the status that Bilal radiallahu ta'ala and who had in the eyes of the believers and how quickly Truly, that jahiliya was expunged completely from that environment and that society when Abu Bakr was freeing Bilal from his master and he's paying him. And the master says that, subhanAllah, uh, he didn't say subhanAllah, of course, he laughed at Abu Bakr and he said, even if you paid me less, I would have given him to you. You're overpaying. You didn't even bargain. If you paid me even less, I would have given him to you. And Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he replied, what? That even if you asked for more, I would have given you more. Umar radiallahu anhu would say, you are our master to Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the mu'adhin of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We know he was the mu'adhin, that was his title. In our time today, the mu'adhin is not really as exalted and we don't understand the true status of that until we look back at the seerah and the, the, the magnificence of the Mu'adhan and the importance uh, of the Mu'adhan in the time of the Prophet wasallam was not just someone who called the people to prayer. Rather, he was the one who they didn't have Islamic finder in these apps. So he would announce to all of the believers, it's time to pray. He was the one when any important announcement needed to be made. Any time, time there was a call for battle, the Prophet wasallam would tell him to call the Adhan. That was the importance that was given to Bilal radiallahu ta'ala anhu. And then you look at the other mu'adhin, subhanAllah, it's a side point, but it's very important. The two, the mu'adhineen of the Prophet Bilal, and, and many people don't know that Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum was also uh, a mu'adhin of the Prophet And he was, had a disability. So we see a black man and someone with a disability given these two very important roles by the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam but after that statement by Abu Dhar we don't have in our seerah, in our Islamic history anyone who uttered any such statement to Bilal or looked at him a certain way because of his skin color or, or acted a certain way from the, from the believers towards him SubhanAllah so Malcolm X, his statement SubhanAllah it rings very true America needs to understand Islam but today in 2020 I want to amend that statement a little bit for you and I to say that we all need to understand Islam because it is the one religion that erases from its society the race problem. You and I and the entire Muslim world today, dear brothers and sisters, need to understand Islam because it does provide this solution for racism and many of the other ills of society. So generally speaking, Islam, one of the solutions that it provides is an end to racism, but specifically for you and I, we need to work together for this cause. And as Dr. Abdul Jawar mentioned, the verse, Ya ayyuhaladina amanu, kunu qawwa mina bil qisti shuhada alillah. The verse continues to, to express a very important point. Walaw ala anfusikum awil walidaini wal aqrabin. Stand up for truth and be a witness for Allah, even if it's against yourself or your parents or your close relatives. SubhanAllah. This again rings so true today because the issue of racism does not 
is not just something that exists in a vacuum. It's not just something that's an individual problem. It's something that can become a family problem, a community problem, and we know today that it's a global problem. It's a global issue that uh, you know people will look down upon someone because of the color of their skin, because of their background, because of their the culture that they belong to. And so how, dear brothers and sisters, can we claim to be standing up for justice and be a part of a religion that not asks us to stand up for justice, but commands us to stand up for justice if you and I, at the very most, we are complicit in racism, or at the very least, we stay silent about it. Either one of these two, it removes this verse uh, uh, from, from, in, from uh, the application in our lives. That if we are at the very most complicit and we make racist statements, and we learn even from the hadith of Abu Dhar, that one small factual statement can even be seen as racist. SubhanAllah on Facebook just a couple of days ago, and we all are going through our social media and seeing very polarizing um, you know, uh, statuses and statements and images. And one brother, all he said, SubhanAllah, was we should stop referring to black people as black, and he, he mentioned a certain language. Because the way it's used in that language is usually meant as a racist remark. And so many comments, subhanAllah, saying, well, what, what do you mean? What's wrong with that? Um, they are black. Th that is what they are. What's wrong with calling them? And people still missing the point that you don't have to even use a derogatory term just by referring to someone as what they are. Yes, yes, dear brothers and sisters the context in which we use that word can be deemed as racist. So we have to watch ourselves. So complicit at the most, silence at the least, we are participating in it. So what we understand today with George Floyd, with um, uh, uh, Ahmed Arbery, with uh, you know all of the cases before that, all the way to Trayvon Martin and Emmett Till, and we're talking about you know 60s and 70s and, and way, way beyond that, is we can no longer remain neutral. This is no longer a one-off issue. This is no longer an issue that affects just one segment of the population. And even if it did, even if it did, right? So we, the, the other way we, we see it at times is, well, we should help them because we might need their help. We should help them because we also might face and we are facing issues of Islamophobia. And, and, and Muslim bans and all of those things. So some t sometimes we, we use that terminology and even that uh, is true, but that should not be the reason why. Allah did not put a condition here that stand up for justice if that person stands up for you. The other thing we're seeing on social media today, which we have to watch ourselves, dear brothers and sisters, how often do we see them for our cause? How come we don't see them at the rally for Kashmir? How come we don't see su such and such at a rally for Palestine? How come we don't see them at this? That is not, that, that's not our concern. Our concern is, would this verse apply to us and would we implement this verse without any conditions? Allah did not put any conditions on this verse. The Prophet Sallallahu did not put any conditions when he said that, uh, one person is not better than the other, that a black is not better than a white, a white is not better than black, except, actually there is one condition, except for those who are best in faith. Right? Except for those who are best in faith. That's the only condition, subhanAllah. So we do not say, number one, well, what I say about them is true. And this is all the introduction I'm going to get about the practical aspects, inshaAllah ta'ala. But this was very important because we have to understand that we can no longer remain neutral not because it's happening to us but because our religion commands us when we see an injustice the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said let him uh, use uh, action let him use his hands if he cannot let him use his tongue if he cannot let him stay silent but hate it in his heart and that's the least of iman we need to go for the most and perfect our iman bi ta'ala we need to understand when it comes 
to racism, dear brothers and sisters, this is not a new issue. This is not for our black brothers and sisters in particular, and I'll talk about the historical aspect of it in a bit, but even just for our black African-American brothers and sisters, the issue of racism is not something that happened when the camera started rolling. It happened before the camera was even invented. We're talking about 400 years of oppression, starting with slavery, moving to Jim Crow, moving to uh, uh, segregation, police brutality, redlining, uh, you know, uh, school to prison pipeline. We're talking about, subhanAllah, from, from the time that they were tied up in chains and brought over here on ships up until now, this hasn't ended for them, right? A lot of times we say, subhanAllah, uh, again, uh, we have to watch ourselves that maybe they shouldn't have done X, Y, and Z. Maybe this person should not have done what they did. Number one, no other human being gets shot in the street for doing what they are doing. So that's, that's something that we have to understand. But number two, we have to understand, dear brothers and sisters, where this is coming from. This does not just happen overnight. 400 years of oppression. Their great, 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 great grandparents, all the way down to their direct parents today, we're talking about have faced systematic oppression and we have to understand that this is something that is propagated by the country that we live in our country is guilty of 400 years of oppression and we have to understand that before we can move forward inshallah ta'ala when we talk about the issues of black lives matter for example this is something again and i'm, I'm talking about a few things that we just have to watch out when we talk, when we use our vocabulary and our words and how we talk and we say, and again, this is another trending topic on, on, on social media, is the issue of Black Lives Matter versus All Lives Matter. Historical understanding will, will help us get there as well. Imam Siraj Wahad, he said it best. He said, we are not saying that only Black Lives Matter. All we're saying is black lives matter also. All we're saying is black lives matter too. So this issue of, well, all lives matter. And, and we understand, subhanAllah, now that if all lives did matter, then we wouldn't need to say black lives matter. And so obviously, all lives currently do not matter. And so we have to, we have to express specifically that black lives matter. And we should never shy away from doing so, and also the issue, the what about isms? What about this person and this this country and that country and this culture and that culture? What about uh, you know this uh, someone from this background? What about these people who are oppressed? There's a time and place for all of that. Right now, the entire world is burning over one issue. People are literally we're seeing unprecedented times where someone is shot in Minneapolis, Minnesota. People living around the world who don't even can't even point out Minnesota on a map are protesting and standing up for these injustices. What about the Muslim community? So I want to present in the couple of minutes that I have left really quickly five solutions to the race problem that you and I can uh, actively participate in with our families. Number one is understanding the history we have to understand history and now with netflix and 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 you know uh all of these uh, uh you know stations and and uh, applications and um you know that our kids are constantly on and watching take some time as a family and watch some of these documentaries right check the check the ratings obviously if you're if you're sitting with your kids but understand the history of it that Racism and the, the, the issue of racism did not just start even 400 years ago, actually. It started with the creation of the first human being. And to truly understand how evil racism is, we have to understand who the first racist was. And that was none other than Iblis, who when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala ordered him, commanded the angels to prostrate to our father, Adam alayhi salam, and he said to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, what? 
he uttered the first words of racism and it's etched in the Quran till the day of judgment that you created me from fire and you created him from clay look at my color and look at his look at my build up and look at his look at my complexion and look at his subhanallah that was his justification for not listening to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because I am better than him and how am I better than him? Look what I am made of and look what he is made of, subhanAllah. So we're actually following the sunnah of Iblis when we utter statements like that person is dark and that person is black and my skin tone is white. That person is, is, has a darker skin tone than my daughter and he's asking to marry her. That person has a darker skin tone than me and I should invite him to my house. That person has a darker skin tone than me and I should uh, work together with them. I should uh, sell them uh, my house. I should uh, do any business. I should stand next to them in the masjid. I should go to their masjid and pray. We have to understand this is the ideology and the sunnah of Iblis. Who said, I am better than him. Simply based off of one thing. SubhanAllah. So racism is, is, it is an ideology. right? It's a belief system. That even today, th there is this belief system that because I am white, I am more superior than them. The police have been trained to, to, to act in this way, that these people are less than human, so treat them as such, right? This didn't just exist during the times of slave slavery and Jim Crow and, and, and with the KKK. Even today, right, if, if, if you do the research, there's actual training that takes place to dehumanize black and brown people. That's why they were allowed in New York City to stop them on the streets anywhere they wanted and frisk them. Because that's how you treat someone who is less than human. You don't treat a human being like that. So understanding it's a global problem, it's an ideology. It didn't just start today. Understanding the history of it, number one. Part of that history is the history of you know the creation and the world. But the history of our country with the with, with the transatlantic slave trade, which happened 400 years ago, that on that what happened on those ships, the most horrific images and and stories of what took place, talking about millions and millions of people who were chained up and stacked on top of each other for a 5,000 mile journey from Africa to the Americas and the Caribbean. 5,000 miles and they're stacked up. Many of them, 20 to 30% of them on their way here would, have, would die and they would be tossed into the ocean. So completely dehumanized, treated like animals during that. And by the way, 25% uh, of those original slaves that came on those ships were Muslim. And that's besides the fact, but it's important fact for us to know as well. Uh, you know, Sheikh Abdullah Hakim Quick of, of, of Al Maghrib has done an entire course uh, called uh, uh, America Before Columbus and the Muslims who were part of coming here. We're talking about, we know about prince among slaves, we're talking about dignitaries and scholars, ulama, imams, uh, you know, people who are well educated, who were uh, tied up and brought over here, many of them dying on the way, many of them. Being uh, anytime there was a sickness or disease, they would throw all of them overboard. Subhanallah, that's the history of our country, and we should know this. We should know this. So it is our problem. Um, you know, when we talk about uh, why you and I should be concerned, if anyone you know on this call right now, anyone in our families uh, comes from uh, ha has migrated here, my parents have maybe. Those of you on this call, either you yourself, your parents, or your grandparents may have migrated here in the 60s or 70s. We stand on the shoulders of those civil rights activists in the black community who fought for their freedom with the Immigration Act of 1965, which allowed us, 1964, 1965, which allowed the opening of immigration from the subcontinent and from Asia and other parts of the world, subhanAllah them fighting and struggling for their freedom allowed you and I 
to be living in this country completely uh, living in freedom. And we, we say we make statements such as, well, only if they did X, Y, and Z, right? And we enjoy our freedoms and our liberty. So we have to understand the history of it. Moving quickly, inshallah, um, we, we, we understand already that this is uh, just the act of racism and, and making racist statements. Not only is it a sin, but it breeds other sins such as pride and, and, and arrogance and, and mocking others. Well, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly addresses this in the Quran. Ya ayyuhaladheena amanu, oh you will in, in Surah Al-Hujurat, the entire surah, this entire chapter, if we talk about racism and 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 you know making fun of others and using insulting nicknames Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has addressed this subhanAllah in an entire chapter of section of a chapter the chapter 49 surah al-hujurat where he says do not let a group among you make fun of others they may be better than you subhanAllah and so we understand that it is a sin we and if we do understand that we have to be able to internalize that fact that it is something that is hated in the sight of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then we can move forward inshallah because what happens often is we belittle the action we'll say stuff like well what, what I said there was nothing wrong with it it was true it was a factual statement but we understand that this small statement of ours the Prophet said that on the day of judgment there will be groups of people who will come and they will be completely bankrupt. Do you know who the bankrupt person is? And the companion said, a bankrupt person, someone who has no money, they lost all their all their wealth. And the Prophet said, no. Rather, it is the one who comes on the day of judgment, expecting mountains upon mountains of good deeds, and it's wiped away completely. They've become bankrupt completely. Why? Because they infringed on the rights of others like our previous speaker talked about as well they mocked others they made fun of others and every single time that was done they lost good deeds and it's going to get to the point where they run out of good deeds and they take the evil deeds of the other person the people that we degrade we criticize we make fun of we 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 we, we make arrogant statements towards make fun of their complexion or their skin color all of that could come back to haunt us on the day of judgment. So we have to be very careful about that. Number three, it's not enough to just condemn, to protest, to hashtag, and you know, to share the blackout on Instagram and all of that. We have to do that, but that's that's just the first step. But we have to ally with our African American brothers and sisters. How many massages and how many communities do we know of who are struggling? to even pay the rent or even keep the lights on, especially with COVID-19. How many communities, uh, African-American, Masajid, specifically, I'm even talking just the Muslim, African-American Muslim community, SubhanAllah, in our locales, maybe 20 miles or 30 miles away, but they're there. We don't even know who prays there. We don't know the Imam. We don't know uh, anything about that masjid. And SubhanAllah, where many of us, and it's not something we should feel guilty about, but it should make us have a responsibility that we're living comfortably in our communities, in our masajid, billion dollar masajid that on the 27th night of Ramadan will raise one, two million dollars for. What about those other masajids and communities? What happens often, dear brothers and sisters, is we tokenize, um, you know, and, and we do one-off events, uh, again, the hashtags Black History Month. We wait for these times, or we go and do a Feed the Hungry program, we'll go to the downtown area and we'll do something for the African-American community for an hour or two. That is not enough. We have to ally with them. We have to integrate with them. We have to go and pray in their masjid, take our children to their masjid. We have to be able to network with them to see what it is that they need. What can they help us with? There's a lot that they can teach us. And what is it that we can help them with? Truly, that is when that actual spirit and brotherhood of Islam will come about that Malcolm X talked about, which I started this, this conversation with, that Islam has a solution and can put an end to racism. And so, you know, subhanAllah, I, I, I remember even when I was, uh, I was five, or, uh, five or six years old and, and my father passed away when I was six, rahimahullah ta'ala, 
the was the was the MGA of this of of, of ICNA and, and a member, and you know he came here as an immigrant as well, and just you know 10, 15 years before that, and one vivid memory that I have, and I don't remember much, was that every Ramadan he w we lived in a small apartment at that time in, in in New Jersey, we would have a huge iftar, and he would invite the entire African American community over to our small apartment, we would have 30, 40. It was in a big community at that time, not a lot of them around. And he would invite them all over for iftar and we would you know, have iftar with them. It got so big that we had to start renting halls. So every year this, this would take place. And even after he passed away, this is a tradition that our family continued. And I remember, subhanAllah, maybe 25 years after that, I was visiting an African-American community and, and leading Tarawi there. And one really old man walked walked into the masjid, maybe 70 or 80 years old. And I recognized him. I said, you look a little familiar. Are you from you know this community from, from back in the day? And he said, yes. And I said, I remember you because you used to come over to our home for iftar. I mean, this is 25 years later. And subhanAllah, he remembered every bit of that. Right, and he commented on the spicy food, and he commented on everything. So, Subhanallah, it's to 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 just open our doors and say, you know, we're having a dinner party. Why don't you come over? It doesn't even have to be made into an event or a you know extravaganza or a big show, but just getting to know one another. As Dr. Abdul Jabbar mentioned, the verse, "Lita arafu." Allah says, we, we made you different for a reason. What was that reason? So that you get to know one another. But outside of that, even we have to ally with these causes because our religion commands us to, because they are the oppressed. The Prophet ﷺ said, your help will only come to you, subhanAllah, from the weak when you're serving the weak among you through those efforts. You know, uh, Dr. Muhammad Khalifa, uh, I was listening earlier to a lecture, uh, a conversation. He's a fellow at Yaqeen Institute. And he had a conversation with Sheikh Umar uh, Suleiman. And he talked about this term of exoticizing black history and black culture. You know, we're going to have an event about black history in the masjid. We're going to invite this one person to come and talk. And then one year later, we'll do it all over again. Usually it happens around February, Black History Month. So we have to become those allies you know uh and, and i know my time is up and I'll, I'll i'll rush through the last uh two points really quickly is ending the stereotypes in our communities and our families that we should take a stand against ending these stereotypes uh and and that's self-explanatory as as we mentioned abu Dhar making that one statement we hear that statement we don't let it slide the prophet ﷺ did not let it slide and he said something very harsh to him uh in return and fighting on their behalf doing our part locally in our communities via uh politicians representatives right now in congress there is a bill uh, by 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 Justin Amash, uh, he's independent from Michigan, and there was a Civil Rights Act of 1871, um, where Cong Congress allowed individuals to sue the state and local officials, including the police, if their rights were violated. But in 1967, and you see how we're going backwards. There's a Civil Rights Act of 1871. In 1967, not too long ago, this was gutted completely. Um, by by adding a, a component to it called qualified immunity, which means you cannot sue the. It's very difficult to sue the police. The only way you can do it is if they do something to you, and there's precedence for the exact same thing happening before that. So uh, you can look it up, but it's something that's being voted on as we speak. It's being talked about, calling your representative, uh, voting on this, uh, voting in general. Obviously, when we have the chance because these things are decided at the very, very local level. Understanding things like redlining, when we make statements like, well, why are they in this situation, right? Some people will say, why don't we talk about how they got into this situation? And again, history plays a big role in all of this. I want you all to, to when you get a chance, Google the word redlining. It's one word. Redlining is something that was legal in this country up until the 1930s when African-Americans quote unquote, got their freedom. And we know they never really got that freedom because even up until the 50s and 60s with voting, they were, they were 
their freedoms were always very limited. Redlining was when, when bank lenders were prohibited from lending loans to communities that, of, of color that wanted to buy houses, purchase houses or property. They were prohibited. There were literally red lines on maps that were given to lenders and banks that you cannot give a loan to anyone living in this area. You know, something, and, and, and uh, when we talk about the riots even that are happening, it's something that's very interesting. If you study history again, redlining, why a black person cannot own a business in their own community, but an Asian person can. Someone who looks like me, I can go into an African-American community today, open up a liquor store, open up a, a store that sells all kind of junk to them, but they cannot open a business in their own community because of these type of past laws that affected their grandparents, their parents, and even them now. That, and I'm not advocating for burning a business ever, but you understand a little bit of their pain. And we know that these are actually agent provocateurs who are setting fires to their businesses. But even if it was the case that a black person who's angry at what's happening in their community and they went to that length, we, you, you, would, uh, you would feel their pain a little bit if you understood the history because they themselves were never allowed to open a business. Someone else who's living in the suburbs comes and opens a business in their neighborhood and makes money off of them. And that is now a symbol of their oppression. And if they're in the streets protesting, they're seeing that symbol of oppression. I'm not advocating for rioting or, or looting or anything like that, subhanAllah. But we have to, if we understood the history, we would understand at least why some people are so upset. Understanding our history, dear brothers and sisters, plays a big role in this. The school to prison pipeline that that there's there was actual studies done on this that this this starts at school right this starts for many black students in school that 31 percent of uh, of school related arrests uh, are are black students that three that black students are three times more likely to be expelled than white students but you have to read the whole the sentence and you have to hear the whole phrase that black students are three times more likely to be suspended or expelled at school for the same exact thing that a white person did. That's the issue, right? We, we usually say, well, they're being suspended and expelled from school. Why is that? But they are being suspended and expelled from school at a three times more rate than a white person who did the exact same thing. We have to understand the context of all of these things, dear brothers and sisters. So when we talk, even there was a study done, uh, an entire study that was done, and you can look this up, where uh, they experimented uh, during job interviews, where it started on the phone and the employer would, uh, there was a two times more likely chance that you would get a second call for the interview if you had a white sounding name, whatever that means. But that's the actual thing that happened. Uh, and, and SubhanAllah, so these are things, dear brothers and sisters, um, and, and the other, the last thing I'll conclude with, because it, there's there's so much to say, but I'm talking mainly to our Muslim community, especially if we came from overseas and we're the children and grandchildren of immigrants. These are statements that we make sometimes. We have to understand the context. The U.S. Census even did a study because often we say it's not about race, it's about class. We say it's not about color, it's about you know uh, why aren't they putting in more effort. And so the U.S. Census actually did a study that a black person with a college degree was less likely to get the same job that a white person with a police record applied for. That's something that's very telling. And we have to understand that there is clear discrimination. And we, number one, cannot be part of the problem. Number two, we cannot be silent. And number three, we cannot... Uh, participate in that in any way but more importantly we have to stand against that oppression even if it's against ourselves our families or our loved ones as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us the ability to practice what we preach to implement what we learn we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to end the suffering of all the oppressed locally and abroad we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to allow us to be a catalyst for change and to use us and not replace us. Wa akhru da'wana and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Wa jazakumullahu khayran.
والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الله أكبر